Good evening, my friends. This is Paul, and today I'm here to deliver a very special behind-the-scenes video where we take a look at the making of my top 10 most epic Switch games of 2022 video and just let you guys know what went through my head, some of the people involved in making this project a reality, because I am my own worst critic. I know how to tell when one of my channel videos stinks, and this one is actually one of the best ones that I have made. So I thought that just in case some of you didn't catch all the little Easter eggs and surprises that we poured into the video, that now would be your opportunity to find out how it works. Before I get into the specifics of this video, I just wanted to say that I have quite the history of being a list maker. I have been doing top 10 lists of the best memories of the year ever since 2011 on Facebook. I think I did one in 2010 in my autobiography, so it could be longer. But then Facebook got rid of Facebook notes in 2020. So then ever since then, I've started making best memories lists. But then ever since 2018, I also wanted to make best games lists. And ever since my 2021 video, that was when, as I was doing the number one edit for my friend Todoroki's script, I learned how to do audio tracks. And so with that knowledge in mind, I decided I wanted to make this edition flashier, have better background music, and just overall try to give this a more professional look, while at the same time people can still say, yep, that's a Paul video. Ever since my 2019 lists, I wanted my videos to have a specialized opening sequence where I, you know, introduce my general thoughts on the year and give an overall introduction. And my pattern has lately been to highlight the good and bad DLC of that year. So in the case of, say, my 2020 and 2021 lists, they were the Smash Fighters that came out that year. I just got footage of all of them fighting each other with one of the latest stages and music tracks playing. However, 2022 hasn't seen any new Super Smash Bros. Ultimate content. So I thought that I wanted to get a little bit more creative. Since the Mario Kart DLC post wave three was kind of disappointing in the graphics and overall production values department i thought well why don't we go to another avenue of switch online the games and so well <laughs> this was completely unintentional by the way i just thought this would look cool but banjo kazooie was ported onto the switch online expansion pack and I'm just really glad that the Baron Bird can finally be back on a Nintendo system. And hopefully Switch owners who are maybe new to the Nintendo scene can say, Oh, wow, a Nintendo-published 3D collectathon platform on the Nintendo 64 that's actually good. Sign me up. And then they can wonder what the big fuss was about them joining in Smash. So regarding the audio track, I just used the Spiral Mountain theme because that was the level I chose since it's, you know, the tutorial level of Banjo-Kazooie. And I also wanted it to seem like I was playing the level, but I had used fancy editing tricks to get rid of all the sound effects, when in reality, it was just that I muted the footage sound effects and just put in an audio track of the Spiral Mountain theme. So... Going forward, before each numbered entry, I used a video from Oak Bluff's fireworks show on YouTube. Uh, you know, it's a fireworks show. There's not too much to talk about. But I wanted the fireworks to get progressively more intense as the games went along to have a deeper celebration. I've watched other top 10 videos from other YouTubers, not saying they did a bad job, but one thing that they tend to do is they tend to reuse the same background for every number something announcement. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted the general theme of fireworks, but I didn't want just the same old generic fireworks shot. So I just went through the video and said, oh, that looks cooler than before. So if you watch the video again, you'll notice that the fireworks got progressively more intense. My number 10 game was Sonic Origins, and so I knew 
that I absolutely had to do Carnival Night Act 2 music because it was remixed specifically for Sonic Origins and it happens to be my favorite tune in all of Sonic 3. Yes, even beating out some of the original compositions that Michael Jackson and Brad Buxer worked on in the Sega Genesis version. I don't know what people see in the original Carnival Night music. It just kind of sounds too weird and slow, and it feels like it was done by a completely different composer than the rest of the soundtrack, which it probably was. That's probably why I didn't like it. And not only that, but since I only liked half of the collection, I wanted to zero in my footage that it was just on Angel Island Zone so that it could highlight the best part of Sonic Origins for me. Not much more to say here besides I don't mind doing controversial things as long as it makes me happy and as long as people get to hear my thoughts. If they don't like the music choices, then oh well, everyone's music tastes are subjective. For Life is Strange Remastered, I didn't want to risk the possibility of having licensed music in my video. I didn't really know how to check to see which of the songs were original compositions and which were licensed. So I just used uh, public domain guitar music to get the job done. And I think most Life is Strange fans would probably not be able to tell the difference. And besides, most people that watch YouTube videos don't really go into it looking for the music. They want to hear what I have to say about the games. So one of my themes when arranging the footage for the Life is Strange section was that, and, and this is a, a theme going forward so that I don't have to repeat myself so much, is I don't like just simply rehashing footage that I already used for my reviews. I want people to see some new footage in case they're bored of me repeating stuff as I don't really like it when I'm watching like opinion pieces and the person just loops the footage over and over again because they can't find something else that's interesting to look at. So I wanted to make sure that if there were people in my audience that actually paid attention to my Life is Strange review that they could see something that was visually different. So I just decided to pick off right where my review left from. It left off with the paint about to splatter all over Victoria, and so this section started with Max consoling Victoria. I did want at least a little bit of Chloe action in there because I wanted the audience to see a visual representation of why Life is Strange was only number nine so that they could see, oh yeah, Paul's not just making stuff up about Chloe being a jerk. They, we could actually see for ourselves that she's being very selfish and not at all being considerate of Max's dilemma. I also wanted to have some of Max's time travel powers be in the shot, but I just barely ran out of footage before I could show it to its full extent, so that required extremely precise timing. It also involved a little bit of a jump cut, where at first the tools under the table are by themselves, and then like the cardboard box just magically appears under them. But I think the shots that I did before that to signify that Max was turning on the washing machine to get the tools to drop that people got the general idea that, oh, Max learned from her mistakes and now she pushed the cardboard under there, so they get the general idea. Hopefully, the visual storytelling of the clips helped to emphasize my point further as to why it was only number nine. Since Kirby's Dream Buffet kind of starts to blend together after a while, it was a matter of counting how many Grand Prix I had done in my review footage so that when I looked through the regular footage that I had captured I'd be able to say okay this is where I can start from so that the footage is different. As far as the music this was a no-brainer. I had to go with Rolling Quartet Jazz Band because it just sounds so big bandy and I love music that sounds like or actually is real instruments. Now I don't have any way of confirming this but I'd like to think that it's real instruments or at least mostly so I thought it sounded good enough for what the source material offers. And I also think that while it is possible to play Running Through a New World from Kirby's and the Forgotten Land in Kirby's Dream Buffet, I figured I've already got Forgotten Land on the list anyway, so I might as well save that audio track for when the number six option came up. For Three Hopes, using the battle after the one where my review ended, 
probably seemed like a nice simple choice. Oh, hey, that battle was long enough, so that'll do. But there were also a lot of moments in that battle where the characters were kind of just running around without fighting. And I wanted most of the footage to show action. So I had to find a balance between running around enough where you got the gist that that's a frustrating part of Warriors games to begin with while at the same time still having action. As far as the music choice, Between Heaven and Earth is one of my favorite songs in Fire Emblem Three Houses, and the rain version of it here in Three Hopes was absolutely remarkable, so I had to do it, especially because I don't like the more rockish renditions of the Three Houses tunes in Three Hopes, so I'm really thankful that they showed restraint everywhere else besides the thunder tunes and kept to, to a more simple orchestral style that Three Houses was known for. Same song and dance for the footage with Kirby and the Forgotten Land, but one interesting thing is that the music just happened to coincide with the next level as Running Through the New World is by far my favorite song in Forgotten Land and I really wanted that to play, although the audio track that I got was really loud. I mean, the song is just loud in general. It's very triumphant. It's supposed to be, you know, Kirby's big jump into 3D. So maxing or er, balancing my voice and the music and making sure my voice was louder was a little bit of a task, but I'd like to think for the final product, it was done pretty well. For Persona 5 Royal, there really is no better song than Last Surprise. It was such an iconic battle music in the original Persona 5, and I'm glad that they didn't outright replace it in the Royal version. It's also my favorite Persona song that was included in Smash, and boy am I glad that they kept that in, because that actually appeared in Smash before it appeared in the actual game on the Switch. As far as the footage, I just thought that the audience would be bored with too much palace exploration, so I kept it to mostly just the battles, and the only palace part I showed was using Joker's third eye to spot hidden materials. Millic Meadows was such an iconic piece in Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Of course, a lot of the orchestra pieces were spectacular, but Millic Meadows was early enough in the game that I think it was like that game's version of Gower Plain, where like those two themes are synonymous with the fields in the Xenoblade Chronicles games. The problem was that I didn't have footage that showed the actual Millic Meadows itself. So I used the footage of Noah and his gang running around in the field and then just put the Millic Meadows as the audio track to make it seem like they were in Millic Meadows because it did kind of look like a little bit of a meadow, don't you think? There's not really much more to say there. I just really wanted Millic Meadows in there, but I didn't want to spoil the audience. But if I had done any more of the footage I had captured, then that would be a spoiler. So I'd like to think the mix was really well done. Mario Plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope has an insanely good soundtrack. Nearly every single one of them is absolutely magnificent. But Beacon in the Dark Mess in particular is the theme of the final boss, or at least the final Dark Mess boss of Chapter 1. And I thought that it sounded very triumphant and celebratory. And so I thought, well, that actually sounds like it fits the theme of a top 10 list much better than just some over-the-top orchestra piece. And, you know, it still was an over-the-top orchestra piece to begin with. And I just so happened to have footage of that battle. So it looked as though I was just playing the game, but with the audio, or with all of the audio except the music turned off. I bet a lot of people, when they saw the thumbnail, probably thought that the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe was going to be my number one game of the year. So I kind of wanted to fool the audience a little bit into making them think that it was, because I honestly did debate over making it the number one for quite a while. I just ultimately decided that Nirvana Initiative had so much cooler of a plot twist, and it had all of the Zero Escape references, and the post game was phenomenal, and the overall genius packed into its narrative and its writing made me consider it over Stanley Parable, which was funny, but like, it's easy to make gags, but it's not so easy to tell an extremely, just outside the 
box, mind-blowing storytelling experience. So for starters, I had following Stanley as the music because Stanley Parable's music is kind of forgettable, but that one has that triumphant goal towards reaching the end, which is, of course, the reason for why it's being played in the game as well. And then Exhibition was just because that song was too short. I didn't want to just loop it. So I thought, well, Exhibition is showing off a certain part of Stanley Parable that's new to the Ultra Deluxe version. So might as well give that a little nod. But then I did a little bit of a fake out. You see, I, I put the, the biggest bit of fireworks from the fireworks video and didn't put an audio track behind it like I did with the other ones so that people would think ooh ooh let's keep you in suspense because you won't even do a music preview only for me to do in the legendary Phoenix Wright hold it for none other than Kevin Brighting himself coming on and talking in the voice of the narrator criticizing me for making the game only number two. Reaching out to Kevin was actually surprisingly easy. All I did was I found out his email address online. I asked him if he could help for the video. I sent him the script. Yes, I wrote that out. The only thing he did differently was I originally wrote, I bet your number one game is some overpriced $60 Wii U port, and he changed that line to an overpriced piece of nonsense, which I showed that to my sister, and she said, yeah, that actually does sound quite a bit funnier. And I honestly like that change a lot. I got rid of the part where I said, it's not like he ever asks for likes or subscribers anyway, because I didn't like how I had written the word anyway twice, because the line right before that said, I bet most of you will disagree anyway. So not a knock on Kevin, more a knock on my writing, why I cut that out. So for that reason alone, like this is one of the highlights of my year, just that I got the narrator to be in my video. I know he's not the hardest to get to do collabs, but like for a small YouTuber like me who has Catholic in the name, like dang, he must have been a really accepting person. Now before we get into the number one, that part still hasn't been fully filmed yet as of the time of recording this, but I just wanted to say that I wanted the celebratory screen to be different than just the fireworks, to really set it apart as this is the number one game, guys. So I put a loop of the Donkey Kong, Diddy Kong, and King K. Rule celebrating during the Banjo-Kazooie reveal trailer, because that was one of the most exciting moments of my gaming life, but the cheering sound wasn't them from the trailer. It was actually the people in the audience when I did my demonstration at my 2018 mission trip when I proved that I was miraculously healed. So yay for me sneaking in a little bit of Catholicism in a movie that's not strictly about it. As evidenced by the change of scenery and me having a different t-shirt, this was filmed quite a bit after the previous sections. We're actually now in 2023, so hence why I changed the intro from the usual that you've been seeing since 2021 to my updated 10 years of being on YouTube intro. So hope you like that little editing touch. For AI the Somnium Files Nirvana Initiative, we're going into full spoiler territory because I went into full spoiler territory at this point because it was the number one. So this might be your cue to leave the video in case you still want to play the game for yourself. So if you are one of those people, then I thank you for watching the video. If you'd like to join my Patreon, the link is in the description. So remember to keep the faith, stay epic, and God bless. So for the rest of you, I started out with just a generic image of the characters just so that I could give the people who didn't want to be spoiled time to leave. And then after that, I wanted to show that one of my favorite parts of Nirvana Initiative was the reveal that the timeline was out of order. So I showed the bit where you're in Marble, the bar, and... Mama is revealing how the timeline truly turned out. Now, as far as Todoroki's bit, she scripted that, but she was unable to actually do a recording herself. So I just read it out in her voice. That was a killer. I didn't realize how imitating her voice would be so hard on my throat. I just barely managed to do it. In fact, even just now, talking like this is already hurting my throat. So, 
I, I, I'd like to think her script went pretty well, and I didn't improvise or ad-lib too much because it was just such a great script. I didn't feel the need to make a whole lot of corrections or jump in with my own jokes. I also really appreciated how she mentioned the trailer in which Mizuki was playing 999 on her Switch, or whatever the equivalent of the Switch was that they wanted to do to avoid copyright. But getting the trailer to be properly timed with my slash her words was a bit of a task, so I'd like to think the final product did good enough where it showed generally close to when she slash I were saying that. I also liked the fact that she actually included the 999 Somnium in her script so that I had an excuse to use the footage of that post game. And then as far as the finale... I really just wanted to put in the dance number because I I really love it when Kotaro Uchikoshi's games have dance numbers in them. They just fit so well and even if, I don't know, maybe you want to argue that it sounds better in Japanese, I just think the words are really charming. So with that, thank you very much for watching. I hope you... Oh, wait a minute! You thought I was going to end the video here, didn't you? Well, I have one more little bit of surprise for you. I actually commissioned an artist to do the thumbnail of the video. So without further ado, I have with me Sploon Ghost, who recorded a bit of artist's commentary. So she is going to be able to tell you the thought process that went into the thumbnail. And my gosh, this took quite a long time to make. So I hope you really appreciate all the effort that both of us went into to deliver you a truly quality thumbnail with a whole bunch of references. Hello everybody! I hope you're all having a great day. Uh, my name is Sploon, also known as Baby Sploon, also known as Baby Hawks and Sploon Ghost. It's the same person! And uh, I am the artist Paul commissioned to do his thumbnail for his video Top 10 Epic Games 2022. If you haven't watched it, that video, uh, I, I recommend you go watch that first because yeah, there's going to be some spoilers. So, anyways, so essentially I'm going to give you a walkthrough, an artist commentary of how I came up with the inspirations for different parts of this thumbnail. Alright, so this is obviously the bucket from the Stanley Parable. That was like the big thing Paul wanted at the center of his thumbnail. Uh, the ori original idea, originally I was going to draw characters from all ten games, um, but Life got a little busy, so we decided to compromise, um, and I agreed that I would draw just Mizuki in the bucket. More on Mizuki later. Um, it'll make more sense once I get to Mizuki. So, but definitely the bucket needed to be on here. And in essence, what I wanted to do was just basically replicate this image. That was the easiest thing for me to do. And then, in regards to colors, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of just used the eyedropper tool and was like, yeah, that color! And modified it a little bit so that it didn't look like a direct replica. Granted, looking back at this now, the shading could be a lot better in this area, as well as this area. Uh, I was kind of in a rush though, wanted to get it done. Um, and plus, I didn't think the lighting in this scene in particular that I was pulling the reference from was exactly how I wanted the lighting in this in this thumbnail to be, so that was part of that. Um, the bucket handle, I, in essence what I did was I laid down the base color, let's zoom in, so I may try to make it look a little more wooden. So we have, as you can see, like this brownish base, and then what I did was I drew streaks of different shades of brown, and then I took a smudge tool with this pattern, and I went shh. Now granted, I'm doing this on the outline, but you can see the effect of what it basically did to the color. So there's that. And then, so there's the color, and then I wanted the sticker, obviously, so this is the sticker. And what I did was, you know, I put a shade of gray over it to make it look like it was shadowed, but this is without it, so we have property of Epic Paul. Um, and this is basically, I just made a circular frame around Paul's commission frame. This is profile picture that he commissioned me to make. 
and then I adjusted the angle so it kind of looked offset and not straight on. Um, and then I made rectangle one and rectangle two to imitate that of the sticker a little bit. And then this is the, the ellipse that I use to help borderline the sticker. And then finally this was, so this is the outline of the property of Paul. I basically traced over Stanley Parable alphabet. Um, I used a reference for that and then I just and then I just filled it in with black letters and then added the gray on top. So that's that's the bucket. Uh, is this it? it was. So this was I did not show Paul this so this will be a treat for Paul as well. Basically I looked up Stanley Parable Alphabet, and so I just traced each of these letters from here. Yeah! <laughs> and then to make it easy on myself, I cropped, or I shouldn't say, I masked a lot of this reference so that I just had the bucket to work with, so I didn't have this big hunking, you know, rectangle around it. Originally, I had the bucket sitting on a stool, and what I was planning on doing was putting it in a spotlight, and that it just still stayed in the spotlight. But what I didn't like after I made it was I didn't like how the stool and the bucket didn't quite match in terms of 3D and the shadowing and the light. Now granted, I could have changed that. I could have probably made the stool go back a little further or made it flatter so that it looked like the bucket was kind of tilted up. But I didn't want to, I didn't do that. I was kind of struggling what to do with that. But then I managed to replace it. And um, well, I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, this was basically the original bucket sketch that I drew, which I basically did by just kind of freehanding it from here. This was my sketch for how I wanted the bucket to look. Obviously it didn't quite turn out that way. Now I think if I had stuck with this version of the stool as opposed to this, I think it would have actually worked out a bit better. But I'd forgotten about the sketch. And actually, it ended up working out better than I thought. So that's okay. Then the next key piece of this thumbnail was Misaki. Yes, AI Somnium Files Nirvana Initiative. And essentially, what the initial idea for this thumbnail was, that Paul proposed, was holding Misaki holding the bucket with a disgusted look. And I like that idea. Bad news is, I wasn't quite sure how I would do the perspective of it, so like drawing a, you know, a hand to make it look like it was actually coming out of the page. And so I was sketching Mizuki, and I ended up sketching her in a different position, and I really liked it. This was the original sketch that I had, this was then the second sketch I did. And obviously it didn't differ too much from the outline that I ended up doing, but I realized her head was too big so I shrunk that, and I adjusted her arm positions because they weren't quite right. But yeah, it wasn't too far off. So this was this was the final sketch, the final outline. And then these were... Uh, I basically did a color scheme that matched where I literally took the eyedropper tool, we go to her, her reference, you know, for her jacket, I literally went pink. And then that was this. And you can see they're kind of similar. I took like the bright parts of her vest. And so they're very similar in color. Um, and the same thing, you know, with her red tie and her skin color as well. So that's how I came up with the color theme. I didn't want to mess that up. Uh, and then the other thing about Mizuki that was requested by Paul was to include a little bracelet. That's all I'm going to say. Comment if you know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, you know, keen viewers will, will know this. So, that's Mizuki. So, at this point, I just wanted to show that we have the stool, we had the spotlight, we had a dark background, and that was it. This was what I showed to Paul, and then I said, hey, what if I included some Easter eggs based on whatever else is in your list? So he sent me a giant email with um, trailers, and discussing the video game, the game, the games themselves, as well as their general gameplay. And props to you, Paul. It really did help. Really did help me with coming up with some ideas of, oh, I should do that. 
For example, the rabbits. Like I said, I didn't like the stool, and I think if I had drawn the stool the way the sketch had it, it would have been better. But I'm glad it worked out that way because then when I add, when I put in the rabbits from Mario and Luigi instead. So here we have number one, number two, and number three on his list. I thought it'd be really funny because when I saw what I saw in the trailer, the rabbits were kind of like, ah, what is this? Mm, I thought that would be really funny from the have a plunger holding up a bucket. And they're just like, oh, what's this? So yeah, that's where that idea came from. So then I had the title. I thought that was okay. But then, as you'll notice on his list, if you recall from his list, Fire Emblem Warriors was number seven. And I know Paul absolutely loves Fire Emblem Warriors. So I decided I definitely wanted to include something with that. Now recall, this is the background, right? And I thought, oh, what if I have these symbols instead? Ho 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 ho. Then what? And I'll show you how I got these. And this is new for Paul too. So Paul, I hope you enjoy. So essentially what I did, I made three rectangles. And then I used the eyedropper tool again. This is like my favorite tool. So I selected this area. And then I changed, swapped the background and foreground color to get this. I swapped them back again. And then you come here to the rectangular tool. And essentially, I kid you not, I did some math, whereby I knew this was going to be 3,500 by 2,000. So I did 3,500 divided by 3. Oh, this was the width of that rectangle. That's how I knew how to do it, and because I wanted three rectangles to be snugly fit across the entire screen. So I have my two colors up here. Then I go to Fill, and I go to Gradient. And then, so originally the fill was, you know, if it was colors. Oops. But then, here, I'll go to Gradient, and then selected Basic. And this was how it, it did it. And with the blue one, I did the same thing, but the back color was this blue instead. And then, with the yellow one, it was this color instead. Right here. And I knew I had to include something Fire Emblem-y for Paul, because he loves Fire Emblem. Alright, so there's the spotlight. We have the rabbits now and Mizuki glowering at the bucket even though she's number one. Whatever. So now we have the title. Great. So initially with the title, it was just this. Paul wanted black with blue. That was it. And I did that. And now I didn't tell him this, but I did that and I thought, wow, that looks awful. That's not going to show up at all on YouTube. I can barely see it here. So, I did another layer, where I made it blue, with, and origi originally this white for epic was black, but Paul really wanted the epic, I knew Paul would want the epic to stand out, because he loves the word epic, so I decided to make it white instead, with a blue background. And so that's how that worked out. Now this text, this font, I just freehanded. This is my writing. This is not the Stanley Parable writing. In order to do the subtitle, featuring Kevin writing in Todoroki, Paul wanted me to do the confusing ending up font from the Stanley Parable. Ultra Deluxe. So here we are. So I, it's the same thing as what I did with the property whereby, with the property of Epic Paul, whereby I just made it 50% and then on a new layer, I just started tracing over the, the letters. I know they were not all in line, so I had to line them up manually. And I'll show you, I only traced the necessary letters. So for example, I knew I needed a capital F, just one. But I knew I needed an E and an A, and the E would reappear seven t several times, and the same thing with the R. So to get this R in exactly the same place, but later on, and I did, so if we take L, so we're going to do a loop. So if we loop this R right here, bink, we zoom out a little bit, and then V for the move tool, and then you hold Alt Ta-da! And then, as you can see, it shows you I've moved it to the right 292 pixels, but I've moved it up and down 0 pixels. And that's how I made perfect replicas of the, uh, the letters for some of them when I needed to. And that's how I did it for the property of Epic Paul, too. So there's that. Now, if any of you know a faster way to do this, please let me know. 
because that was time consuming. I could do it, but it was time consuming. So, oh, I should mention this is my first ever thumbnail I made. So if you have any critiques or suggestions for future thumbnails, should I ever make another one, feel free to comment. If you are allowed to comment, I don't know what what Paul's gonna do with this video, or or I guess just send him an email or message him and saying, hey. Bloom wanted me to critique, so here's my critique. And then the final little reference. We saw a little bit of it earlier, but I basically wanted Kirby from Kirby's Dream Buffet, which is ranked number eight on this list. And I thought it would be really cute for just Kirby to small have a small appearance. He's a small boy right away, right now, in front inside this little oh, I thought it was like a little hoop, like a ring where you know you're just kind of swinging and hanging along. But he's you know, his eyes are up on the treat. He wants the little treat! Which I just did by redrawing this. I did not trace. I just kind of estimated, like, this is what it would look like. And kind of outlined it based on what the colors were here. And yeah, that's pretty much the thumbnail. Yeah, so overall, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, Paul was very kind and kept reminding me at my request. He said, oh, do I need to remind you every Saturday? I said, actually... I'm glad he did, because after like the fifth time, I was like, I don't want any more reminders, so I'm gonna actually do this. Or the fourth time. I don't know when it was, how, when it was, Paul, but... <laughs> I got it done. Um, and yeah, one other thing is... Initially, I did not have of. It was originally Top 10 Epic Games 2022. But then Paul wanted of, so I inserted of in here. And I'm glad it did. It made it line up a little better. And... Um, just it's in my opinion. Yeah. So, sorry, that was a bit long, but I wanted to show y'all, you know, what my thought process was with the art artistry of it. This is Spoon's artist comments, and yeah. Alright, back to you, Paul. Thanks for having me.